Welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm George Hammond, Chairman of the Humanities Forum, which organized tonight's event. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome the online and live stream audiences uh, across the country. And it's also my pleasure to welcome John Judas back to the Commonwealth Club. Um, John has been here several times before, and we just did a program a, a year and a half ago on his last book on nationalism. And now he has a book on the socialist awakening. Uh, welcome, John. Thanks a lot for coming back and joining us this way instead of the usual way. Yeah, my, my pleasure, though. I wish it was the usual way. Yeah, we love the live audiences, but, uh, but we yeah. appreciate our online and live stream audiences for now. Uh, so, John, as I said I, uh, when we were chatting ahead of time, um, I'd really love to start with your quotation uh, in your book, which is, socialism is about people being more important than profits. Um, that's a very interesting definition of socialism and certainly different than the, your whole book is, is, is a, a better more full take on what socialism means because there's a very easy uh, Marxist uh, anal analog to uh, what people think about socialism. Um, but I, I, the current crisis has made a lot of people choose people over profits. Um, of course, some of it's in force, some people don't like doing it, but it gives us an idea about how much cooperation there is. What, what do you take from that as to the possibility of being a little bit more sharing in the future? Well, um, you mean the pandemic and the uh, economic recession together. I, I think that the initial effect has been um, to pull people apart as much as to bring them together. And you could see mm -hmm. it in the controversies about masks and things like that. And, you know, I think that's a good reason why we really have to uh, replace the current president, because that's he's stoked any possible divisions that exist. Uh, mm -hmm. As far as uh, capitalism, socialism, questions like that, what it does do is it brings forward the need for some kind of major government intervention in, our, in healthcare, transportation, energy, all these different kinds of uh, sectors. Uh, one, of the, one of the reasons that people have been leery about uh, any kind of socialism, including the very uh, mild version that I, I described is uh, that we, we have in America this kind of default uh, revulsion against big government. Mm -hmm. But this is an occasion like the Great Depression of the 30s where we have to have it, where government has to step in. So it's not, not a question of whether, but it's uh, what form it takes, whether it takes the form merely of giving business huge subsidies in the hope that they'll trickle down to the rest of the population or whether it takes the form of a, a more democratic egalitarian intervention into the economy. Yeah, you take a very good, interesting uh, take on the socialist awakening in your book on how intertwined socialism is with sort of the democratic ideal. Um, I think a little bit of history on the socialism pre Karl Marx, um, because I think that that's uh, I mean, it goes, goes all the way back to Plato talking about having the, the leaders be, be uh, you know, share things in common, et cetera, et cetera. So why don't you uh, give a little background on what really happened in the early 19th century? Because it was, it was tied up with a totally different set of ideas. Well, socialism in the beginning was uh, very tied up with uh, Christianity and with the mm -hmm. idea of the Sermon on the Mount and with the idea of ideas of cooperation rather than competition and altruism rather than the selfishness, mm -hmm. uh, communal uh, co cooperatives, uh, utopian socialist communities. Uh, and that's really remained an important strain in uh, socialism, particularly the Christian part. And I, I'm, I'm not trying to make a uh, brief here for Christianity because you, mm -hmm. you find the same kind of ideas in reform Judaism as well. Mm -hmm. But it's, uh, it's again about caring for people, about cooperation as a, the idea of social, the social part of socialism. Mm -hmm. uh, that precedes uh, Karl Marx, it precedes the Ref Russian Revolution. And I think a lot of what we're seeing now is a resurgence of these older ideas, uh, even pre-Marxist ideas about what socialism is. When kids start talking about socialism, I, I did a lot of interviews during the campaign of uh, Sanders supporters, both mm -hmm. 2016 and now. Cooperation comes up a lot. Mm -hmm. um, 
the idea again of the Scandinavian socialism, where there's this uh, really very generous welfare state where people don't have to worry about health care, education, and things like that. So these are not things necessarily characteristic of uh, of the you know Soviet Union or Venezuela, uh, but they do they do go back to early 19th century on the one hand and to uh, some of the things that are happening and have happened in Europe since World War II. Yeah, you you mentioned that I'm, I studied in the Soviet Union. I went there in '73 um, and. Uh, I, I suggested to Gorbachev when it all fell apart, uh, I mean, just in a, in a letter that never got answered or, or read, but I, I thought he should go to the, uh, the UN and, and make a speech and say, you know, we Russians are always extremists and, uh, you know, we took this to this extreme, uh, but you should all thank us for it because you now have, you know, um, you know a safety net uh, democratic system that seems to be working a lot better and is a lot more stable than what you had before we did this experiment. So, um, you know, you walked away with some good ideas from us. So I think uh, maybe that's a, a part of what you were saying about, about the way Europe did uh, it uh, and the way the United States did it, but that socialism is a much broader concept. And, and people are talking about, you know, they're socialist or they're communist, you know, as, as a, such a, a negative thing. They're going back to the fears of the 1950s, um, you know, with, with the McCarthy scare and the, the Cold War and those were our enemies. Well, that's right. And it's a, it's yeah. a, it's a generational thing. I think that people who grew up uh, as I did from, you know, when the 40s, 50s, 60s, uh, 70s uh, still equate to some extent uh, socialism with the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. The kids, people uh, grow up uh, born in 1985 and later or so have a much, much different vision. And I think what happened was, and this showed up before uh, Sanders ran for president, is uh, because of the reaction to the uh, Great Recession, which put a lot of younger people in this position where, let's say, they did go to college, but they found themselves uh, very frustrated about getting a job. At the same time, they had these huge student debts to pay. Mm -hmm. We're faced with this uh, climate crisis, which is uh, very similar, I think, for them, not for me, but, it, but it's very similar to what we used to feel in the 1950s about nuclear war. It's, a, mm -hmm. it's a very immediate, and it's something that's seen as a result of unregulated capitalism. So I think mm -hmm. that there was a revulsion in that during that period for these people who had not grown up in the Cold War against, there was something wrong with capitalism and what came as an alternative to a socialism, but it was a much different kind of socialism than the socialism of Karl Marx or uh, uh, the Soviet Union. It was, a, you know, again, it was a socialism, people before profits, uh, equality, greater equality of income, race, mm -hmm. sex, um, things like that. Yeah, it's interesting you, you talk about the other times. I mean, there was obviously a lot of talk about, you know, outright revolution in the 60s. Um, but there's the great line in, in uh, John Lennon's song, Revolution. Uh, if you go carrying pictures of Chairman Mao, you ain't going to make it with anyone anyhow. You know, that, that, that basic thing, <laughs> That's like, cute. You, you, can't, yeah. you can't go that far, right? Uh, uh, right? And I found it interesting in your book uh, that you described uh, Xi in China today as a right-wing authoritarian, you know, I, I thought that was uh, interesting to call him right-wing. I mean, I understand from his behavior, but he is the, the, the leader of the Communist Party as well. So um, why don't you draw a distinction between, between the, the political parties that have used the name? Uh, by the way, one of my favorite uh, anonymous quotes is, uh, an idea is not responsible for the people who believe in it. Uh, so, so we have a lot of people in, in, that have used the socialist and communist names that, that uh, you know, you really uh, wish hadn't. <laughs> but uh, why did you make that point? I thought that was a very interesting point to make, that, that G was, is actually a right-wing uh, authoritarian and not, not a left-wing. Well, I, it, it was a kind of throwaway point. The left <laughs> right. but, but look, I mean, the the, the socialism, including the socialism of Marx and Engels, comes out of the Enlightenment, mm -hmm. late 18th century. 
American Revolution, French Revolution, and uh, democracy is a central part of it. I mean, Marx was not, did not uh, see a uh, dictatorship or totalitarianism as part of uh, his idea of, of uh, socialism. And even with uh, Lenin, you see it as a kind of, the, they see themselves as kind of a transitional state and that eventually, it's just that eventually never came. Yeah. Um, you would get a combination of a planned economy plus democracy. It just, you know, didn't happen. And what you got instead was a planned economy where the planning itself allowed the party to concentrate power entirely in its own hands, not only political, but economic power. And where that again, in turn shifted toward uh, the very top of the pyramid, the um, Stalin, in this case, Xi in China. Mm -hmm. So uh, th that's an idea that is right wing into the, in the sense that it's antithetical to the uh, ideals of freedom and equality that, that come out of the enlightenment and that are part of the 19th century socialism. So you, we had, you know, you, you mentioned the early Christian socialists, utopian socialists, the, those ideas. And then there was Marx that, that obviously uh, became extremely influential with his approach. Um, but you mentioned uh, I think a, name, a man named Berger who was in the Milwaukee Socialist uh, and how they eventually have influenced Bernie Sanders. We'll get to Bernie, but why don't you give us a little background on the Milwaukee Socialists? Well, the Milwaukee Socialists um, were different from the uh, Socialist Party of Eugene Debs. They were sort of seen as the right wing of uh, the old American Socialist Party. Uh, because uh, they believe that socialism uh, would itself come through what we now call incremental reforms, mm -hmm. uh, unemployment compensation, things like that, mm -hmm. uh, fixing the sewers. They were called the sewer socialists in, in Milwaukee. <laughs> uh, so people didn't have to vote for them with the idea that only socialism of a Marx, Marxist variety where the society, where the government would own all the means of production uh, could solve their problems. And as a result, they stayed in power. They, the uh, socialists in Milwaukee stayed, um, they, were, they were the leading uh, party for, oh, I don't know, 40, 50 years. They alternated, mm -hmm. they, in the 50s, they, they died out. Uh, mm -hmm. But they they remained where the American Socialist Party itself uh, became uh, a footnote to our uh, the, to the national history. So when you describe Bernie, I thought you did a great description of Bernie, especially the quote uh, on page 49, for those of you going to take a look at it, about how he described when he was running for mayor um, and, and what socialism meant. Um, and it, it seemed like he combined the Milwaukee Socialists with sort of hippie ideas at the time. And, and I, I thought that was a very interesting start to the man who obviously has uh, reignited socialism in, in our country. So why don't you say well, a little, give us a little history about Bernie and how, even, even though a lot of people say a lot of things about Bernie, almost no one says he's changed his ideas uh, during the last 50 years, right? Yeah, but it's actually true that he dramatically changed his ideas. I mean, right, Bernie, Bernie was an orthodox Marxist socialist with a lot of uh, hippie kind of free love and stuff like that that you'd find in Vermont among the communes uh, thrown in. Right. Um, I say that he went to, uh, I'm the same age as Bernie and he went to Vermont and I went to Berkeley and there, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Two poles of the same thing. He was not hard left. He was not one of these Maoist types. Mm -hmm. uh, he was, all, he was always a Democrat, small d uh, Democrat, but he believed basically that um, uh, socialism would consist of public ownership and control of all the means of production. And uh, when he became uh, mayor uh, of Burlington, uh, basically he said he ha he'd have to you know, lay aside those kind of ideas, but he still said that was his objective. He still saw himself as a Debs or Marx socialist. When mm -hmm. he runs for Congress the second time, he loses the first time and he runs in 1989 for the 1990 election. 
he dramatically changes his ideas. And that's when he starts characterizing himself as a Swedish style socialist and talking mm -hmm. about things like national uh, health insurance, single, single payer as a goal, free education, all the kinds of things that you do associate now with Bernie Sanders. Mm -hmm. And denying that he wants to eliminate, for instance, markets. Uh, you know, again, I, I think uh, I think the the collapse of the Soviet Union had a big influence on Bernie. I think that for mm -hmm. many of us in the '60s who became socialists, our idea was sort of if you could have the Soviet Union plus democracy, that would be socialism. Mm -hmm. But the, the, you know, trajectory of the Soviet Union showed that this kind of central planning where there are no markets and stuff like that uh, mm -hmm. is, not, is not the answer. And I think that that was a big influence on Bernie. And I think also, and this happened to me too, he sort of put one and one, and one, 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 one together and said, well, how can we possibly get from where we are now, mm -hmm. which in his case was the Reagan-Bush era, uh, to something, uh, to some kind of Elysian fields of socialism and, you know, realized again that, that he would have to take a more reformist approach. So both of those come together. And in 1990, Bernie ex uh, runs, except for the Democratic side, he's still an independent, mm -hmm. runs as the kind of so democratic socialist that he runs in 2016, 2020. But he did not have those views before that. So he did really change. And he won, I mean, he won as mayor in, in Vermont and he also then won as congressman. What, what kind of numbers and why, is, why would Vermont, you know, is, is, was in a situation, because um, you go into this in your book, that they would vote in a democratic socialist who says that's what he is. Um, it's an unusual thing in America, so. Well, I think it's partly, it is Bernie's kind of authenticity as a politician. Yeah. Uh, the fact that uh, unlike some some of the sort of socialist activists now, he really did uh, uh, enjoy being among people who were not uh, uh, didn't go to college and had professional degrees. He really he thought he had a particular liking for dairy farmers and for campaigning among them. Yeah. And uh, Vermont also uh, was a state that uh, was, uh, you could almost say, inundated by the hippies in the uh, 60s and 70s. I can't remember the percentages, but a huge number of people emigrated into, uh, into Vermont uh, during the 60s, 70s. Uh, so they really changed the politics of that state. I, I don't, I think he would have had a, a, the same kind of um, time in uh, if he tried to be mayor of Manchester, New Hampshire next door uh, yeah. in 1980 and uh, uh, win a congressional seat there. Now he might, you know, he might have, somebody might, but not then. Not then, yeah. Well, it, the, the way you described the hippie invasion it almost sounded like the Huguenots, uh, you know, getting kicked out of France and it all, they all were leaving New York and uh, moving to, uh, to, the, to the countryside to live authentic, uh, you know, rural lives. Um, and then right. it changed the politics and then ended up, in a way, changing the politics of the whole country, um, the way Berkeley did, like you said, uh, as well. So uh, fascinating background history. So let's let's bring it up to today a little bit uh, on, on current politics with Bernie. Um, obviously, Bernie, uh, I mean, there's a lot of uh, stuff about what happened during the 2016 election uh, to keep him down, et cetera, from the Democratic uh, Party. And, and this time... Um, there was he was doing very well. And suddenly, you know, uh, Biden, who hadn't been doing well until South Carolina, suddenly everybody said it's going to be Biden. So so how do you feel about, you know, Bernie's part in the Democratic Party and, and also his influence now? Because he's got an influence and maybe that's what he wanted. So. Well, yeah, I, th I think that that he succeeded probably beyond his wildest expectations. Mm -hmm. uh, especially in 2016, certainly beyond my wildest expectations. Yeah. And uh, he, he did move the Democratic Party to much more towards a position of putting, put, putting people first. That's actually an old Bill Clinton uh, yeah, slogan yeah. <laughs> from 1992. Um, and to towards Medicare for all, uh, now 
Biden talking about a pu public option, um, redistributive tax reform, things, things like that. Uh, I think he was limited uh, by the same kind of generational factors that I described. Uh, the fact that uh, for people uh, who grew up in the midst of Cold War, his uh, democratic socialism was anathema still. I mean, they, mm -hmm. they, dis they distrusted it. And uh, again, I think that was particularly, was particularly true in 2020 when uh, Democrats understood the kind of threat that uh, Trump posed to, to, uh, the, to the American democracy itself and, uh, uh, and to our own uh, well-being. And, uh, uh, you know, Black voters tend to be among the most realistic of American voters. I managed to find this when I was a journalist, and I think they, they sized up the situation and thought that they would do much better with uh, Biden in uh, November tw mm. 2020 than they would with Bernie. And I think that rather than some idea that Biden had better programs or anything like that was... Oh. The electability factor was overwhelming and uh, uh, re really uh, undermined Bernie's campaign uh, after he won the Nova Nevada caucuses and it looked like he was going to be the nominee. Right, right. Um, so Bernie's had a lot of influence on the Biden programs. Um, from your point of view and, and uh, from maybe Bernie's point of view, if you know it, um, how much does he expect that to get put into place? Or how much of it is a political accommodation for the election? You, well, how, I, how do you listen, look forward? I, what do you think? I, I can't speak for him. You'd have to ask him. I okay. don't know what, you know, <laughs> what his expectations are. But, uh, you know, what, what presidents do are uh, is a kind of... The, uh, I, I don't uh, focus that much on personalities. The... Trump is maybe an exception in that case, but but really the presidents are uh, what they do is a kind of resolution of different vectors. One is um, the circumstances that they face. Uh, the mm -hmm. second is um, who are the most influential people in the party and in the country. And mm -hmm. I think uh, that with with Biden, uh, you, you're going to have circumstances where he's going to have to go big mm -hmm. in, in a way. He might not have done if he'd been elected in, let's say, 1988 when he first uh, ran, ran for president. Right. So he's going to have to do big things. How far he goes and what shape they do it takes will be influenced uh, by uh, uh, the power of business, by the fact that he really has had to depend to some extent on large donors, Silicon Valley, Wall Street Democrats. So, it, you know, it's going to be a fight and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's not clear to me uh, whether he will go far enough. I mean, part of the problem with Obama in 2009 mm -hmm. was that he really didn't see, uh, make the political calculations of what he would have to do to maintain his majority. And some of the compromises he made, uh, for instance, with the, again, with the donor class, the bis business class, not being tough on Wall Street right away, yeah. I think uh, damaged his political, uh, the, his and the Democrats' uh, political chances in 2010 and then ended up uh, undermining to some extent uh, his accomplishments, the uh, Affordable Care Act, uh, mm -hmm. even financial reg reform. So um, will Biden go big enough? You know, and there's all these questions about the filibuster. Will he be willing to uh, mm. support ending the filibuster, which really, if Democrats are going to do anything, uh, has to go. Uh, you mm. won't get something like the public option in health con insurance without ending the filibuster. Well, it's the pretty dead because of the Supreme Court uh, issues, uh, you know. Yes. So, and the so court, it's, it's, it's certainly what issue. it looked like the filibuster couldn't be destroyed maybe 10 or 15 years ago. But right now it looks like it's certainly uh, doable. Right. But but a lot of his case and the case he's particularly making now is that he'll be a bipartisan, he'll be a bipartisan president that he'll yeah. bring together Republicans and Democrats. And th those are going to clash. And they're reinforced again by the by. I think you're going to see the business lobbies and people like that 
not wanting him to take uh, dramatic steps, for instance, on tax reform, mm -hmm. uh, progressive tax reform, not wanting to do his program on economic uh, patriotism, where he says he's going to penalize companies that um, uh, send jobs overseas and reward companies that stay here. Again, those are big moves, and we just we just don't know whether he's going to actually do them. You have to you have you have to wait and see. And you hope that there's enough pressure from below uh, that, that he will. Yeah. So well, we have questions coming in and please, uh, you know, uh, for the live stream audience, please keep uh, sending us some questions. We'll get to them in just a little while. But uh, before we get there about some more uh, stuff about current politics, I'd like you to discuss a little bit more about your ideas in your book because you lay out the importance of, for example, the importance of nationalism in an effective form of socialism. You, you take an un, unusual stand on that because a lot of uh, socialist thinking is international, worldwide, that kind of thing. And I, I, I thought it was very nicely realistic. So why don't you explain your ideas in that area of socialism and what would make it more effective? Well, let me put it this way. I think that Trump has really made the country crazy. And <laughs> one of the effects he's had is uh, driving uh, his critics to extremes. Mm -hmm. For instance, uh, support for something like open borders. I'm entirely uh, uh, supportive of the idea of giving a path to citizenship for the immigrants who are undocumented. Um, but you also have to have borders in a country and you have to have uh, uh, requirements for citizenship. And the reason you have to have that is because uh, the, the public support for things like a welfare state are based upon it. They're based upon the idea that if you and I pay taxes, we're willing to have them go uh, for the benefit of people that we'll never meet, we'll never see, but that we realize are like us Americans. Now, if you start saying things like you're gonna have Medicare for all, and if somebody comes into the country um, uh, again, uh, not legally and, uh, uh, goes to a doctor's office for a checkup, they're going to be as eligible for free health care as anybody else. You're not going to win public support for that. Canada little, doesn't do it. So you yeah. have to have an idea of a common nationality and of certain requirements that go with it. Democracy itself is based upon that idea. I mean, one of the things I think that, uh, made voters leery of uh, Corbyn and, uh, uh, in, in Britain and of his supporters was the idea that anybody from the EU could vote in national elections if they were living in, in Britain. You know, yeah. odd idea. Uh, and uh, it's certainly not something that would appeal to Americans. So again, in that sense, I think that, that Trump with his America first stuff and his uh, intolerance and bigotry towards Mexicans and Mexican immigrants or whatever, has made people take completely opposite uh, positions on things. And, you know, again, if you want to go on this one more step, I'd say the same thing with the defunding the police stuff and abolishing the police positions <laughs> like that, which are just, again, might have apply to certain localities, but mm -hmm. in terms of a national program and what, what uh, we have to do um, in all towns, cities, suburbs, and, it's it's nuts, and it's again. I think it's a way in which uh, in which <laughs> you know Trump has made people go to absolute extremes uh, mm -hmm. in opposing uh, injustices that are, that exist within the society. A little bit like a replay of Nixon and McGovern. You know that you, you, it it was a lot easier for Nixon to push his law and order uh, thing with McGovern on the other uh, as his Democratic opponent. Um, and then win a landslide. So uh, I don't think there's, Trump is about to win a landslide, but it is a big issue. And I think the easy way to, for people to understand it is, like you're saying, if you made it uh, borderless so that uh, anybody who came to the country would get free medical air, uh, care, then we'd have medical tourists. And, and uh, if you made education free to everybody, we'd have lots more foreign students. Um, and, but to re the reverse it, uh, people aren't happy with the idea of allowing the corporations to go everywhere with their business and, and bring their businesses everywhere. But that has improved the lives of, of hundreds of millions of Chinese and Indians. And, and people don't focus on that, right? That, that, that all that work 
has been out. So that in a way, it's like a foreign policy, if you wanted to talk about it from that point of view, to help other countries um, to allow the corporations to do that. But that's not the way anybody looks at it, um, or almost anybody looks at it. And it's certainly not popular, even if you described it clearly. Yes, and it's it's historically not the way that uh, uh, people's more moral uh, uh, circumference, the circles that we draw around yeah. who we care for most, uh, exist. I mean, we just don't worry that much about somebody in Bolivia as we do about somebody uh, in our family, somebody in our city. Some, and the, yeah. the the goal is at least to get a common national sentiment. We don't have that, and that's wrecking the yeah. country. That's why we have uh, one of the worst welfare states of any advanced uh, d- democracy is because you get something like Obamacare. And you, you remember at the time it was uh, opposed by probably, uh, you know, 51% of people who thought, well, we're going to be paying money to sub- subsidize them. You know, who, who knows who them is. Yeah. But again, that's a, that's a product of not having this kind of common sense of who we are and that we're all Americans and we're in it together. So that the, the, the major reforms in the country have come during the, what, Great Depression, World War I, World War II, you know, again, periods where we had this sense of commonality. And, well, you know, mm-hmm. we have to regain that. It's positive. And you can't have something like the, again, the, the kinds of socialist reforms that I described uh, mm-hmm. without this sense of, of national commonality. So that's the kind of nationalism I'm talking about. Yeah, uh, it, it was. A, it's obviously, uh, you know, uh, uh, something from sociology and everything. But people will care about themselves, and then they'll care about their families, and then some people will maybe care about their towns. I mean, once you get out to even something as big as America, that's almost too much for most people to to, uh, to focus on. Um, what about the 60s? Because there was, uh, you know, the, the the great society reforms. It wasn't under the same pressure. Um, of of uh, World War II, the Depression, and so on and so forth, but it succeeded, and it was a very difficult uh, and and a big switch, both the civil rights and and the uh, Medicare medical system, so on and so forth. Why do you think it happened in the '60s? Well, uh, t- t- two things. First, you had these uh, incredible movements, civil rights movement. Mm-hmm. That's that was the, that's a major factor, and the way they went about it again, which should be studied uh, very carefully by people who are engaging in protests now. I'm I'm too old and confined to quarters, but but yeah. really again, the the example of how Martin Luther King did it is very very important. Second thing is the Kennedy assassination and how that just traumatized the country, and led to this uh, incredible. Uh, well-being, uh, um, well, Lyndon Johnson got this incredible boost and in 64, mm. 65 was able to do these things by 1966. No. Yeah. Yeah. The you know, again, the waters had parted, uh, in 63, 64, 65 after Kennedy was, uh, assassinated, but, uh, the goodwill ran out after that. Yeah, the timing the timing was uh, crucial, and and Kennedy obviously was interested what? in getting Reagan his program. wins in what sixty six, governor of California. That's mm-hmm. that's that's it. Yeah, that, that's really. <laughs> oh, I was here. I mean, you know. Yeah, yeah, that, that was, was the end of. Yeah, I mean, you still had enormous the important things happening, uh, consumers, uh, environmental stuff, which was supported by business in the beginning. Uh, mm-hmm. But in terms of civil rights and the and the welfare state, that pretty much is over by '66. Mm-hmm. All right. So um, one of the questions um, is: If Biden wins, what do you think will become of the socialist awakening? Well. <laughs> I want to I want to make a, 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 a distinction here that I make in the book between right. socialists and shadow socialists. Um, wh- when I talk about the ideas of socialism, I would say that really there wasn't a dime's worth of difference between what Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren were advocating. Mm-hmm. 
Right. Now, you know, of course there were differences, but, you know, on some points, uh, Warren might have been to the left of uh, Sanders uh, mm -hmm. on finance, for instance. Uh, so what we ha have had in this country, and, it, you know, it almost goes back to the 30s, is an aversion, again, to using the word socialism and the identification of socialism with the Soviet Union so that an aspiring politician, somebody who wants to be a senator and uh, somebody who wants to be a, a congressperson from someplace other than the, you know, the Bay Area or, or where have you, I has to really think twice about using the word socialism. Mm -hmm. But what we have had in the country over the last, you know, 20 years or so is the growth of people who have these kind of ideas, again, about greater equality, about shifting power uh, from business to labor so that uh, there are uh, labor laws that make it easier for people to, to uh, join unions um, even co-determination, this idea that, wor that workers could serve on corporate boards, which was an Elizabeth Warren idea. Uh, these kinds of ideas, you find them among the Progressive Caucus in Congress, which is, what, 95 people. Again, senators like Sherrod Brown, uh, Mer Jeff Merkley, the guy from Oregon. Again, so it's not a question necessarily that a, quote, socialist politics and a socialist movement will sweep away American politics in the 1920, the 2020s. Mm -hmm. It's more the idea, again, that these ideas themselves will have a lot of staying power. And whether they are called socialist or not, I think you're going to have to wait for a few decades uh, until really the taint disappears from these older ideas of what socialism is. And then we'll see. But as far as I'm concerned, I don't care what the, what, what the idea what the title are. is. Yeah. What the title is. The thing, though, I would say is that it can't simply be a collection of policies. There has to be some kind of a unifying idea. And I think that's why there has been, to that extent, a, a socialist awakening in American uh, politics, because it's, again, it's a way of tying together a lot of things. So another question is, um, uh, slightly provocative, but the, since Christianity um, has almost never been implemented. Um, why do you think that the secular form of it, uh, of, of sharing would take place when uh, nearly everyone uh, uh, acts like a greedy little capitalist individually? <laughs> well, where does your hope I, come I, from? I, That's another way of saying, it. where does your hope come from? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a very uh, cynical person. I, I don't uh, think that's true. I mean, again, yeah. it's obviously not true in, in families. And again, you have to go in concentric circles and um, go st start with the family and widen out to the neighborhood and times of uh, peril when the country uh, uh, faces a foreign enemy, uh, World War II, even after 9-11, uh, mm -hmm. people come together and they're willing to sacrifice their lives for a greater good. So I, I think the, uh, the potential exists and, and I would repeat again, this is why uh, Trump has been such a destructive president. I was mm -hmm. one of those people who, before November 2016, said, well, you know, he has a few good ideas about multinational corporations and, uh -huh. and things like that. And uh, you know, I voted for Hillary Clinton, but I was not worried. Other people were smarter than me. Because uh, mm. I thought that Trump would sort of sand off the rough edges and be a president uh, like, mm -hmm. you know, George W. Bush, for all his mistakes, uh, was a president for all the people. But he wasn't. And uh, he is an extraordinarily divisive uh, figure. And, and uh, we, we basically we have to get rid of him on November 3rd. Um, because otherwise uh, you, you will be you won't be necessarily a situation of everyone for himself, but you will have uh, very angry groups. And uh, remember in the er late 60s, we had the, what the more than four bombings a day. Uh, yeah, this is true. You forget this. Uh, you're going to see a lot of that if Trump gets uh, reelected. It's going to be a, it's going to the country's going to be a nightmare. Mm -hmm. And if he doesn't get elected. 
doesn't get elected, we have a chance. And you, you don't uh, think that again, the, uh, the uh, his, his supporters will react the same way? May not. Yeah. I, I think, uh, but again, I think the period after November third uh, for, for to what is it, January twenty first is going to be critical, and and everybody's yeah. worried about that. Yeah. Uh, um, but we can we can get I, I sincerely believe that we can get over the kind the kind of polarization that we've suffered in the Trump years. I don't do not think is something that's a permanent feature of the country. Yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting thing. It, it seems to me that that uh, part of the polarization uh, is a self-inflicted wound by the both the Democrats and the Republican parties um, in, in their gerrymandering in order to make their seats safe in the 80s and the 90s, because by doing that, they, they made the primaries, the, the crucial election and the primaries tend towards something more to the edge in both parties. And I think that that's helped split the parties, uh, you know, towards their edges instead of towards the center. Um, so I, I think it's, I don't think the people have been uh, polarized as much as the parties have been polarized. I think the, the yeah, people- I think that that, I think that's, I, I, I agree with that, but I would add uh, the way in which the process of deindustrialization that's occurred since what late seventies, early nineteen eighties, and that picked up uh, in the China years and the early two thousands has split the country and and really created kind of two completely different ways of life. Uh, on the one hand, small town, middle, middle size uh, America that used to be uh, based on manufacturing. And on the other hand, mm-hmm. these big Bay Area, where I live, New York, Boston, Chicago, these cities, post-industrial cities that mm-hmm. uh, where there's a lot of wealth as well as inequality and where the industry is completely different. And we have this and the, the, the polarization in the country to some extent matches that kind of difference in the society. Well, you, you know, you talk about a lot of different uh, ideas of how to deal with the, the outcome that you're looking for. And uh, one, one of the ideas that I think uh, is totally counterintuitive uh, to the way people think, but it might have a big effect would be if you eliminated the corporate tax, um, because it's just it's just a hidden sales tax. But if you eliminate the corporate tax, then then they wouldn't need to borrow so much money uh, in order to have uh, interest payments that cover their profits, and therefore they don't pay tax on it. They're, they'd have not anywhere near the incentive to take their work abroad. In fact, the work would come back because there'd be fewer taxes to pay. They wouldn't have to transfer their money out. Um, and all of that is uh, the effect of what is really just a hidden sales tax. Um, and it, it, it reminds me of uh, the fact that I don't think democracy has sunk in uh, deeply enough yet. We still kind of think we live in a, monarch, a monarchy. And so we, we think that we're against everything. Uh, the, the people are against us. Anything that's big is against us. And uh, it seems to me we could control this with clever ideas, but that's a totally another other way to, to, to come about towards socialism or, or towards sharing, um, because uh, that's, the end, that's the end goal uh, to me. And, and, and obviously, uh, in the way that you look at socialism, too, there's no reason that, that this has to be, you know, this competitive fight in the dirt all the time. Uh, that doesn't, that's not almost anybody's self-interest, except for the people well, who love look. chaos. I'm not a, uh, to say I'm not an expert in tax policy is an, uh, you know, an understatement. I have yeah. friends who are, but I'm not. But if you look at the um, charts of the percentage of income that comes from business taxes and, and individual taxes, you do have a, a steady decline uh, from whatever the 1950s, I think 1970s and ni- late 70s. Um, car, under Carter, it started and then accelerated under under Reagan. Uh, so we do get this. We have a diminishing uh, returns from uh, from our corporate taxes. Mm-hmm. Uh, but again, if we eliminated them entirely, we'd have to raise individual taxes even more. So, right. Uh, but as it, as it is, I mean, a corporation doesn't doesn't pay anything. As you say, they diminish, but it also skews everyone's decision in the corporations for how they're going to, because they, they want to minimize their taxes. If they took that out of the equation, especially as it's minimized, 
all you do is, is uh, pay more for their products because they're going to cover it, which is a sales tax, but you've also skewed their decision-making. So it's, it's, it's a totally different time. But I actually think that that idea would be one of the great uh, parts of the arsenal of creating a more socialist society to take out institutions mm -hmm. from the taxation and make it individual. But it is, as I said, counterintuitive to the way everyone thinks about it. So uh, we have a couple more uh, questions that have come in. Um, can socialist candidates do well on a state level or will this mostly stay an urban and urban phenomenon? Well, I think it depends a lot on what uh, state you're talking about. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe Massachusetts. Massachusetts has a Republican governor, though. My state, mm -hmm. again, where we have uh, my um, county executive in Montgomery County, we have what almost you know million and a half people here. It's a big, big place. Is uh, a member of DSA, the Democratic Socialists of America, and my, my mm -hmm. state rep is also from DSA. Um, but I'm not sure whether Maryland as a whole would vote for a dem democratic socialist yet. But, but, you know, there are places like that. Uh, and uh, uh, maybe Oregon, but a lot of these states have very uh, hardcore right wings as well as, um, as, well as uh, left wings. And I think, I think Oregon would be an example of that. And so, so would the um, uh, state of Washington. So uh, I, I'm not sure. I think it would depend entirely on the candidate and how they uh, presented themselves. Well, you raised the DSA in your in your answer here, and I, I think you, you do a very interesting history of what was going on with that organization, um, including the vote by the board uh, about Biden, uh, which I thought just to not even uh, check with the membership about it, um, to not support Biden. And uh, also the big switch in, in, in the age group um, between 2011 and 2017, or, or some, some in, in the Bernie, when Bernie uh, rose, the age, the first, the, the membership went way up and the age went way down. So why don't right. you say a little bit about their history and, and what's going on and how that's influencing the way they're, they're thinking? Well, uh, there were, this, this involves me too, because there were two organizations, the New American Movement, which uh, had chapters in the Bay Area and which I was a member of, and uh, the uh, Democratic Socialist Organizing Committee, which was led by a guy named Mike Harrington. Uh, the mm -hmm. author of The Other America, that merged to form DSA in 1982. And uh, it, this was the Reagan years. And uh, a friend of mine who was the political director of uh, DSA at the time uh, quit because he decided that he was no longer a socialist. In other words, it was not a great time to be a, a socialist. They, uh, I saw a survey, I put this in my book, and you'd have to check the exact uh, um, the, the exact numbers, but I think in what it was in 2011 or so, they did a survey and the average age was 68 of the membership. Mm -hmm. And then they did a survey uh, six years later and it was 33. So there yeah. was just this incredible uh, change in the, both the numbers of the membership and the, uh, the composition. Yeah, uh, to the some extent, I think that they still... Uh, labor under uh, some of the assumptions of orthodox Marxists and this uh, going back to the groups from the 60s and 70s. Um, there, there's a big difference in that organization between the elected officials, like my own elected official uh, here, and the uh, people who were kind of paper members. I'm a paper member. I don't do anything, but I... Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I do it like like being a member of the ACLU right. um, and the activist core, which are much more uh, inclined to do things like not support uh, Biden because he's a capitalist and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So I think that they haven't fully evolved in a way that meshes with the uh, with the uh, enormous numbers of people now who are open to these ideas that I, I describe as shadow socialism. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think a lot of their, uh, again, a lot of their activist members saw Elizabeth Warren as some kind of, as anathema, because she didn't, she called herself a capitalist. But probably, you know, I don't know if they have 70,000 members, I would 
guess that uh, 55,000 of them um, would have been very happy with Elizabeth Warren as the nominee. So right. it's a, it's again, I think it's a process of evolution that that or organization is, is going through right now. Well, I think uh, the 20th century certainly uh, demonstrated the uh, absolute usefulness of a safety net. Now, what kind of safety net and how much detail and all that, but the basic idea uh, that there's no reason to, to, to chew up lives and throw them out, um, you know, instead of using them. Uh, I think another thing that's been, been shown along similar lines is that if a society doesn't use their female talent, then they're going to be co totally uncompetitive in another 20 or 30 years, you know, that, that you're, you're, you're losing half of your talent by, by keeping them out of society. But I think right. uh, these, these ideas are from democracy, that is, instead of having someone tell everybody what to do, everybody gets to decide a little bit more, not completely, obviously, but a little bit more about how to live their lives and how does that affect what goes on. Um, and, and I think in times of confidence, people keep expanding. And in times of fear, they, 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 they contract uh, the, the uh, options for other people. So, so I, I think part of, part of our, the, the big push in the 60s was that America was extremely confident at the time about its situation in the world. It was on top of the world. It, had, it, it was the most productive nation. It, it had just won the war and all that kind of stuff. Um, and, and that made it easy to say all the other groups that are part of our society uh, can move forward because we're not really feel threatened by them. We're, we're, we're so confident in our situation. Whereas today, you know, I mean, who would you have imagined when you were in the 60s that you'd be hearing people out loud talking about white supremacy, uh, you know, at this point, other than George Wallace. You know, it's just like, it's, it's, well, incre I, it's, in, it's incredible. I hate but, to say this, but, but I w wouldn't be surprised. I mean, it's a... Ah, uh, interesting. Well, I mean, George Wallace was from the 60s and uh, the yeah. society did split then. And uh, the, the, the Wallace uh, amazed people in 1964 when he ran for president and got the majorities in places like Milwaukee in the primary. So it's a, you know, it goes back a long ways, this, uh, this, this split. And uh, I think that the situation now is much better than it was in the 60s as far as what, what you know, something like white supremacy goes. But, yeah. it's, uh, but uh, again, it's, it's still obviously a problem and and it's something that uh, trump has made 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 uh much worse yeah all right let's see we have a couple more questions here um california offers generous social programs yet features an extreme gap between rich and the poor the homeless etc and the programs are failing or do you think that they're failing and what does this say about socialism's potential in other you words, know, uh, I, yeah. I, li I lived in California for 15 years, but I, you know, a long time ago, <laughs> yeah. I left in 1976 and I follow the politics some, but, but, uh, but by no means, uh, again, I am somebody who knows more than uh, your average Californian. Um, what you have though in California, and I, I know this is pretty much true of the Bay Area, and of Los Angeles, the Los Angeles area, Southern California, is uh, the growth of a lot of high tech industry, uh, which has made a lot of millionaires and billionaires, uh, but at the same time has cre created um, less opportunity in the middle, uh, where, where uh, in effect have uh, the people who uh, uh, clean out the buildings and the people who work there and make millions. So it's a it's created mm. this kind of two-tier uh, society, society in which you have a lot of uh, low-wage service workers, many of them uh, immigrants, and then uh, at the top, uh, professionals and managers who are making um, you know, a lot of money. And I think that that, uh, that, that might be an exaggerated portrait, but that, I think that's true of a lot of the big metro areas uh, in the country, mm -hmm. not just uh, th those in California. And uh, again, we're going to have to figure out how to, how to create this middle in America. That's, uh, I mean, that, that's something that the Bernie talked about a lot. Mm -hmm. And, uh, 
It's something that actually that uh, Trump brought, brought uh, into the discourse in 2016. I mean, there were there are a few things that he talked about that Americans were not uh, uh, were not as aware of before he made them uh, made them clear. Companies going overseas, uh, the, mm-hmm. the, the lacking. Uh, the problems of the middle class, uh, but that he himself has done very little to to uh, resolve. So, California antagonism, but not solve it, right? Yeah, it's, I yeah. mean, I've been amazed during this uh, pandemic. You know, I have a state, Maryland, where what you know, thirty years, forty years, we've had the Democrats, but the unemployment insurance thing is just broken. It's. Uh, mm-hmm. And I think that's true in a lot of states. We have this uh, very, uh, and not, again, so California, it's not just California. Mm. Uh, our uh, our social service system is very primitive in the United States. Mm. Very. Um, but, but still, uh, would you compare, um, you, you talk about the service workers and, 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 and so on. And if you just go back to our uh, childhood, there wasn't. There was a, a different sort of set of incentives for the leaders, for the corporate leaders, and everything. They were a little bit more uh, rewarded with patriarchal status. Let's put it that way, um, and not so much. And not so much with money. And so now that now that it's money that's the reward, um, and that that's the way that the status is attained. Um, the the split has gone tremendously, but. The situation for the, the, the poorest workers, you think it's worse now or it's like about steady for during that time? For the last 50 years, it got a little bit better and then it, it didn't get any better. I, I think that's what the statistics sort of show. I, I can't say, and you'd have to talk about a particular place. But uh-huh. I, 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 again, I think that uh, one of the factors that's really not discussed very much, and if you discuss it, you get in trouble, is the immigration laws in 1965, and then mm-hmm. there, there was another reform in the in the Bush years and the Clinton years, that have led to an enormous increase in immigration, and uh, until very e- recently, uh, uh, an increase in um, uh, uneducated, low wage uh, workers, who created mm-hmm. a lot of competition and surplus in those areas. And I think part of the problem, for instance, that um, African Americans have faced after the uh, civil rights bills, after the civil rights revolution, was that the, they finally could enter the workplace without f- fearing severe discrimination at a time when there was uh, just increased competition uh, from mm. uh, lo- low wage uh, immigrants, and that you know has increased the po- the uh, size of the, you could call it the underclass in America, the people mm-hmm. who really are living marginally. I'm not saying again, that there hasn't been incredible advancement among black Americans and Hispanic Americans, the middle mm-hmm. class, upper middle class. But, but again, if you look at a city like Chicago, where you have these areas that, that uh, are, are, you know, th- third world in their poverty and destitution, um, could that have been different? And um, I think you, again, you have to look at the, at what happens when both manufacturing moves out and when you have tremendous competition for low wage jobs, which make it much harder to unionize them, which make it much harder for the workers themselves to demand uh, uh, benefits and higher wages. So that's, you know, that, that's my two bits on the question, but it's a, it, you know, the way Britain has the same problem with its left behinds and that, that led mm-hmm. to Brexit and uh, the uh, Johnson has tried to, I mean, that's one of the things he's tried to do, do is say he will address is uh, the towns that suffered from deindustrialization uh, after the thatch, during the Thatcher years, but how to do that is very difficult. I had a temporary job in the late 70s, uh, just before I went to law school, and I worked uh, at uh, an accounting firm. And they had a, a department called Toll Separations. It was in telephone engineering. And there were five women all day, uh, you know, typing in their calculators all day long, producing these numbers. And uh, I went up and asked them, and I'll tell a short story version of it. 
what is it that you're doing in toll separations? None of them knew what they were doing. And some of them had been there for five years. Right. They were just calculating numbers. And the, the answer was that they were basically just separating the money that was coming in for long distance calls between AT&T back then and the local uh-huh. company. That was all that they were doing. And, and I was doing some work with new computers and I just knew all those jobs are going to disappear within a certain amount of time. Right. And it made me think about, um, about unskilled labor and that unskilled labor would be one of the biggest problems, you know, in, in the coming decades. How, how do we create, not create work, but how do you take people with that level of skill? It's a skill, but they're not thinking about their job. They're not trying to make it better. They're not, that's not their mindset. And how do you, how do you make them a, a bigger and better part of society? And I think a little bit of the problem over the last 40 years has been right. the computerization, the digitalization of so many, so much work. And, and of course, all kinds of technology before the computer did the same thing um, in, in, in shifting what work was valuable and what work is not. But it certainly has, has encouraged the split between really high-end work that requires a lot of skill and, and unskilled labor. Um, and, and I it also, at the time that I had that, my father was mayor of a small town in, in Wisconsin, Kenosha, which, of course, has gotten famous yeah. lately. <laughs> and... and uh, we, we went down so one Saturday morning to, to do something. Uh, we walked uh, down and somebody was sweeping up the street. And, and my father re- knew him, greeted him and walked on and told me, that man takes a lot of pride in his work. You know, you should, you should treat him as a man who takes pride in his work. And uh, very int- I was about eight years old. Uh, very interesting approach that I think hasn't you know, existed for a while um, to, 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 uh, to respect that kind of work. Um, and both financially and otherwise. But uh, let's see. There's a few more questions in. Let's see. Uh, this one won't take long. Uh, do you see the left and right as just as delusional as they've been for the last century and getting more so? <laughs> think- <laughs> I, I think that there are uh, elements of delusion on uh, bo- both sides. Yeah, on both sides. Okay. That's- <laughs> I mean, you can say, uh, I, but... Uh, I, you know, you could put uh, the Q, QAnon uh, people on one side, and I guess you could put the uh, the very extreme uh, people who were still dreaming about Marx and Lenin, or or, yeah. or even I- ideas about that you could abolish all the police and prisons. I mean, on the other side, I, yeah. I wouldn't say that's a that's as quite as toxic as the some of the ideas of uh, the, the alt right about uh, you know abolishing Jewry or African Americans, but but again, there's delusional yeah. ideas on uh, both uh, sides. The th- the thing that I'd say though is again that among Republicans there are there is now a group of people that you could see, and I uh, most of them are ne- are never Trumpers as you call. It. Mm-hmm. We're starting to think about things like industrial policy and unions. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a journal called American Affairs, and there's a, a new think tank called American Compass, um, that where you might see some um, uh, some some joining together of left and right on certain kinds of issues. Uh, that's promising, and uh, so we're talking about delusions and now there there also might be a uh, some basis for for a uh, common ground on policies like that and we hope that uh, we, we would hope that a president biden uh could could uh, make use of that well there's a, a series of uh, progressive republicans in the midwest uh in in the 50s and before that harold stass and so on and, and they were all in favor of of for example not climate change that wasn't the issue but Clean water, clean air. They they right. they work they worked on all those things to make a better society for everybody and education, those kind of things. So well, there, there's to be, a history uh, in the rebuilt. Republican Party that's not that old, you know. Yes, that that Republican Party is gone. It was gone in nineteen. It's gone, yeah. So, but I'm saying that the germs, some germs that you might see after Trump is out of this off the uh, stage, especially if they get really smashed in this election. Uh, of a new of a new approach that has something in common with uh, labor, for instance, labor Democrats. Yeah. Well, we're we're nearly at the end, but I've got a couple more comments, more than more than uh, uh, questions. But uh, do you advocate only socialist common ownership of the means of production, or also the communist redistribution of wealth? I thought that was an interesting way to put it. 
<laughs> no. It's just, the, it's just the opposite. It's the communist is the ownership, common ownership of the means of production and socialist is redistribution of wealth. I, I, I think we're going we're gonna to have uh, markets and private enterprise for a long time, but there are going to be certain sectors of, of industry and of the economy mm-hmm. that uh, need to either be uh, very heavily regulated or taken over by the government. And uh, that's the debate over health care right now. Right. Well, there's, it, it, it's interesting because the people who totally believe in the market think anything can be monetized, right? That you, can, you can put a monetary value on everything. But there's lots and lots of things in our lives that are not monetizable. Um, education, medical care, they're, they're both kind of right in the middle ground between those two things. Can it be done? Can it not be done? It can be done both right. ways, et cetera. So that's why I think those are areas that are always argued about how much of one, how much of the other should we do? But there's other stuff uh, that in the arts, et cetera, that it's very, very hard to, to do anything except for uh, private support or, or government support. And, and it's done both ways uh, in Europe as well. Um, let's see. I think we've covered all the questions that have come in. And uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll ask one more question. You know, you, you've uh, studied this, you've uh, laid out uh, the different elements of what's needed. Um, you take a very, what, what from a, a, a classic Marxist point of view, a very moderate version of, of socialism. It, it, do you have, have you had over your career and your moves uh, any issues with people in your, in your uh, set of colleagues about where you were headed or how, how they were headed in your discussions with them? Because I, I think that's something that people don't realize. Uh, it, they think of it as a, like a really negative thing, but I think that those shifts and those discussions and everything is exactly what democracy is all about. So, uh, Well, well I, I followed a similar trajectory to Bernie Sanders, but I earlier, late 70s or early 1980s, I decided that uh, the kind of socialism that I had advocated uh, when I was in the New American Movement did, didn't make any sense. And for a mm-hmm. while, I just thought of myself as a progressive. And I started to rethink in the 1990s, the mm-hmm. idea of whether we were actually creating socialist institutions within capitalism, and that mm-hmm. this whole idea that socialism would be an entirely new stage of history that would follow capitalism as a result of a revolution was itself as the glass uh, questioner said a, a delusion uh, yeah. so uh, yeah that that was a big change well you you make a make a great point in your book along with many other points that we haven't discussed uh, that that this um thought this part of marx's thought is was was a, a, an absorption from the culture of apocalyptic thinking um from christianity and and uh, judaism and everything and and i'm sure hegel hegel influenced um, you know, that kind of thinking in Darwin and, and, and plenty of other thinkers in later 19th century, that it's all culminating in something much bigger. Um, and now that we know that that's not happening, um, it's a little right. easier to back, back away from it um, and, and think of something. And I, I think there's no question that you, you talk about socialism within capitalism. I think there's no question that there, you're, you're, we're not going to get back to laissez-faire capitalism with no safety net. And, you know, at least it, it would seem to me that that has been shown to be a very unstable form of government, only satisfying a few people, and, and you're not going to be able to keep it uh, stable. So, so I think your, your hope and your switch uh, was a good move. And uh, we really appreciate, we really appreciate you coming uh, back to the Commonwealth Club and sharing with us your ideas. And so an- ends another event in the 118th year of enlightened discussion at the Commonwealth Club in San Francisco. Thanks a lot for joining us. I will see you again soon. I'm Dan Ashley, the evening news anchor for ABC7 News in San Francisco, and I hope you and your loved ones are staying safe, healthy, and comfortable during these very challenging times. I am also a proud board member of the Commonwealth Club, one of our most important Bay Area institutions. The club has been hosting wonderful events with exciting speakers and topics in the Bay Area for over a century. In times of crisis, Good information and strong connections in our community are especially important. And during the current COVID-19 crisis, the club has really stepped up. Since March 6th, the club has brought you over 200 live streamed events with speakers and panelists, including past governors, secretaries of state, university presidents, and noted health experts. 
Every program includes a live chat, so you and viewers all over the Bay Area and beyond have been able to ask these experts the questions that are on your minds. Every program has been neutral and unbiased in true Commonwealth Club style to get to the bottom of the issues that are so drastically affecting our lives. The club has done all this public service despite being profoundly affected by the crisis. The inability to hold events for the past two months has forced the club to cut its budget and staffing by 50 percent. The remaining staff are working from home to bring the community these valuable and informative live streamed programs. The club needs your support to continue its shelter at home programming. Please make a tax deductible donation to the club now by texting the word donate to 329-4231. That is donate to 329-4231 or visit the Commonwealth Club website commonwealthclub.org. We need the club to be here in the months and years ahead to help inform and educate as we figure out how to get our society and our economy safely moving again. Consider changes to the way we live and work as a result of this crisis and take steps to prevent a future pandemic. Once again, please support the Commonwealth Club now by texting the word donate to 329-4231. That is donate to 329-4231 or visit the website commonwealthclub.org. I want to personally thank you for supporting one of our community's truly great organizations. I'll see you on ABC 7 News and at the Commonwealth Club. Stay safe.